Bo will be our first speaker today. As many of you may know, prior to becoming Cold Quanta's CEO, he was president of D-Wave Systems and a founding member of the Quantum Industry Coalition. He served as CEO of SGI and the president of Cray Research. He was the youngest director to run the computing and communications division at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has served on the board of directors for several public and private companies and was appointed to the President's Information Technology Advisory Council by both Clinton and Bush administrations. Our second speaker will be Denny. He joined Cold Quanta early this year, working with software vendors and end users mapping problems to quantum computing platforms. Previously, he developed quantum applications at D-Wave Systems. In addition to quantum computing, his experience includes the application of massively parallel computation and neural networks. He holds two patents in computer science and algorithms. Denny received his PhD in theoretical physics from Stanford University and did his thesis work at Stanford Linear Accelerator. He was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab as a postdoc and is currently a guest scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Bo, on to you. Great, thanks, Diane. And hopefully this is working. Um, uh, I guess uh, somebody will let me know if it isn't. So I would just add my thanks for joining us today. Uh, this uh, past week is when the annual supercomputing conference normally uh, would have been held in person. This must be the, gee, I don't know, the 30th or 40th time it would have been held. This time it went uh, video, and normally at those meetings we get to see lots of old friends, many of you included, and uh, amongst other things we uh, would have uh, had a bunch of meetings to talk about kind of where this part of uh, quantum computing is going. So, so what we're going to do today is something that we would have normally done last week in person, and we'll look forward to doing it next year in person. But we wanted to give you a little background about uh, cold quanta, cold atoms, and not just for application to quantum computing, but a couple of other things that you might be interested in uh, for the future. So with that in mind, I'll get started. And uh, really, this is sort of a 30,000 feet or maybe 50,000 feet. The idea here is that we're at the start of a new revolution of the information age, the quantum revolution. And we uh, hope to be able to play in that. So if I could advance my screen, it would be a miracle. There we go. Um, so first, why, uh, why are people interested in things quantum? And uh, we'll uh, talk in a lighthearted manner in a second about uh, Mother Nature and the universe, but really quantum, Mother Nature operates the universe in a quantum matter. And so the closer that you can be to operating that way, you can be faster, more accurate, uh, get more sensitive readings, uh, for example, or more powerful, and in many cases exponentially, but we'll sort of just use, you know, 10 to 100 or maybe a 1,000 times better than you can with other techniques. And, and if you're listening, you know probably of the many, many potential things that we can do, with not just quantum computing, but also other quantum applications. So the, uh, this, the idea here is, again, in a lighthearted manner, is to say sort of in the beginning, Mother Nature did the uh, easy things first. So first there were some quantum fluctuations and then uh, uh, kind, of the, you know, kind of the big bang. And then uh, after just a uh, millionth of a second or so, electrons uh, came into being and photon, the photon epoch of the big bang started after about 10 seconds. Not a tremendous amount of light at that point uh, with the photons. And the lighter elements came on after about 400,000 years, and then after about a billion years, the uh, heavier elements started uh, coming as they were ejected from stars and started to uh, uh, coalesce. And the, uh, it took about nearly 14 billion years to create coal quanta, but what we're trying to do is to reunite electrons and photons and atoms, and we'll show you what some of the applications are. And we do it all in within a glass cell like the one shown in the lower right here and that little glass cell is about an inch by an inch by a couple of inches high and uh, 
that is, it's unbelievable, frankly, some of the things that we'll be able to do. I mentioned that we think of this, or I think of this at least as the third wave of the information age, where the first wave was enabled by transistors and integrated circuits, harnessing electrons. And then that eventually led to the bazillion different uh, digital or electronic products that we have today. Who would have ever thought when the transistor was invented around uh, 1950 that that would happen? And then about 20 and 30 years later, as the lasers were able to harness photons, and then fiber optics came along so we could uh, easily distribute them. Uh, that really started sort of the communications wave. But far beyond communications, lasers have come to be used in everyday products. Like, you know, you can listen to music or watch a movie because there's a laser in your DVD player. Or you can have your eyes operated on uh, with, a, with a laser. I mean, who would have ever guessed, you know, 40 and 50 years ago when lasers were coming? And so just as uh, probably people didn't have great visibility into all of the applications as those technologies were being invented. We think we're kind of at the same place now with the quantum wave, the third wave. And the quantum wave builds upon the other two. And in our case, we believe that the best technology to use to uh, enable the quantum wave uh, really are by harnessing atoms. And so we'll talk uh, more about that. Uh, the idea here is that within that glass cell that we saw on the upper right, we actually use all three waves. So we use digital electronics to control the systems and the lasers. We use lasers to cool and manipulate our atoms. And then depending how the atoms are arranged, we can create many different types of products. So we'll give you a little better preview of that in a second. Um, the uh, idea though is it's both simple and incredibly powerful. Uh, these on the left are a list of the types of products that we have had some uh, contracts to create prototypes for or work on. In the lower right again is our one little glass cell, inch by an inch by a couple of inches high. We use lasers to manipulate the atoms and we'll show you uh, kind of how that works. But in a sense, I, I grew up in the digital age and uh, to me, the, uh, it, this is sort of like having an IC fab in a bottle, if you will in that depending how we arrange the atoms and connect the atoms, uh, we can create many different types of, I'll use the word circuits here, not uh, really circuits, but we can create many different types of uh, applications that we can then put into this, these lists of different products. So we'll give you a little hint of some of those. Um, <clears throat> the way it works is again within this glass cell, we put atoms, they'll come from the left side of the periodic table, then we'll give you an example of that. So we put atoms in this um, uh, perfect, <laughs> highly evacuated glass cell, atoms of a particular element, again, left side of the periodic table. And then we use lasers to stop their motion, and Danny will show you how that works. And in doing that, they become very cold. And then we use other lasers to arrange the atoms in uh, different ways. And depending how we arrange them, we can create technologies to be applied or to be used in different families of products. And this is, uh, the idea behind this is uh, how we, within the glass bottle, uh, we're able to control the atoms again with lasers. And then as we manipulate them, we can create different families of products. So again, uh, glass cell at the top, we have atoms. Uh, this technology came about 20 to 25 years ago as uh, people were working uh, to Steve Chu, some of you might know, who was Secretary of Energy in the US, won a Nobel Prize in, I think, 1997 for showing that you could use lasers to cool atoms. And about 100 years ago now, an Indian physicist named Bose, not the headset Bose, but a, a different uh, Bose, took an idea to Einstein, which said that, and not the bagels Einstein, but our Einstein. Uh, and the, the idea was that if you could stop the motion of atoms and cool them, they would coalesce or condense into a new form of matter. At the time, it was talked about as the fifth form of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, and then this other, this quantum matter that came to be called the Bose-Einstein condensate. So it was theorized and uh, it took uh, then about the next uh, 80 years or so uh, to be able to show that in fact, if you put atoms in a glass cell similar to this, use lasers to stop their motion, got them very, very cold, 
that in fact they would coalesce and create this Bose-Einstein condensate. And Nobel Prize for that was given 16 or 17 years ago. Um, so that's the idea behind what we show on the left is that you can do these very interesting experiments uh, creating quantum matter and manipulating it. But if we, within that glass cell, if we arrange the atoms in a uh, two-dimensional lattice pattern, as you see in the picture, here my fingers are representing lasers <laughs> and uh, in each of the gaps between my fingers, uh, we put an atom and that atom becomes a qubit. And so we will show you how we're on the path to creating very powerful and very scalable quantum computers using this technology. If we stack those lattices on top of each other and, and create a sugar cube sort of arrangement, that's how the world's most accurate atomic clocks work. And we're working on a project to create a, a portable, uh, sort of instant on very accurate atomic clock that's ruggedized and could also be used in, in uh, vehicles of one kind or another. If we arrange the atoms in sort of a vector, as shown in the fourth picture from the left, uh, we, we can cause the system to become very sensitive to changes in X, Y, and Z direction the atoms are. And if we have the atoms sort of counter-rotating against each other, we can detect changes in uh, rotation very, very accurately. So it looks like we can use the technology to create positioning systems for very accurate um, recording of how, wherever the device is, how it's moved through space uh, or through the ocean or, uh, or, or in your car at vantage point. On the right, if we turn the atoms, if we tune the atoms a little bit and we turn them into uh, not quite ions, but uh, we turn them into what are called Rydberg atoms, they become very sensitive to radio frequency signals, photons, and uh, because of that, we believe that we can create. Uh, at the start, at least RF receivers that are hundreds to a maybe a thousand times more sensitive than today's technologies. So one, one single technology, the one thing we do and that we're really good at is, is putting atoms in this glass cell and then manipulating them. And over time, I think you'll see just as we did with digital electronics and with photonics, I think you'll see a, an explosion of the types of products that you use, again, based on using lasers and then using electronics to control the system as well as the lasers. So a third wave of the information age is the idea here. And if that's the case, uh, and you think about the other technologies that you could use to be able to build things quantum, uh, most of us, when we say quantum today, most of us think of quantum computing, and uh, most of us have used uh, the superconducting approach to quantum computing. Many great companies, big and small, are working on those technologies. Um, but it looks, and trapped ions are probably the second category that, that some of you have uh, worked on, but we think they're actually, uh, because of what we've talked about, there are more products that are going to come by using atoms and really will enable this quantum revolution that we've alluded to. Uh, so we know that the technology works, we know it's rugged, we know it uh, can operate reliably, and in fact we've launched two systems now to the International Space Station. Really NASA has launched them and we provided uh, part of the technology that was launched. So if you go to JPL's website and look up the Cold Atom Laboratory, you'll see information about both of those, but about three or four years ago, we wanted to see if you could create Bose-Einstein condensates, this quantum matter in space, and do it on the space station. So we worked with NASA, and NASA created a system to uh, hopefully enable uh, creation of Bose-Einstein condensates in space. The system, if you will, if you look in the bottom picture, Christina Koch is holding sort of a dorm room refrigerator uh, sized uh, box that houses electronics, lasers, and at the heart of it uh, is our technology. And that uh, was that box, the first version of that box was launched a couple of years ago and operated on the, the International Space Station, enabling scientists on the ground as well as the space station to create uh, quantum matter, Bose-Einstein condensates, and there, there's an issue in uh, of nature that you see referenced in the lower right that uh, has many articles about it. And in fact, the temperatures being achieved uh, within the hourglass cell in space are nanoseconds pushing, not, not nanoseconds, uh, nanokelvin pushing to picokelvin, incredibly cold. 
Um, and then after, and that, that uh, experiment ran for about 18 months. And then NASA said, you know, we want to continue doing that, but let's see if, let's put a quantum sensor in space. So we worked with JPL and again built, in this case, it actually is the box that Christina Koch is holding, uh, built a, a gravimeter, a gravity sensor uh, that's uh, orbiting the Earth now. So very accurate sensing of changes uh, of gravity. And again, in that, that size package. So a uh, long way of saying that the technology now is known, we can manufacture it, it's rugged, uh, and it's capable of operating for months and months and months at a time and doing really collections of unique things. So that gives us confidence again that over time, we're going to be able to put, put together and field many different types of products. So what we're trying to do with Cole Quanta is really lead that quantum revolution that we talked about and uh, do that by helping create revolutionary quantum products built on that single core to help solve your next generation problems. Um, and the idea here is sort of shown pictorially in that around that quantum core, again, depending how we arrange the atoms, we can create quantum computers, clocks and positioning devices, and then RF signal processing devices, and many, many more. We're just gonna, using these to uh, exhibit them today. So uh, sort of at 30,000 feet, I suppose, this is a rough roadmap of the different technologies that we're working on. They're each phased a couple of years apart. First up is quantum computing, and we're uh, working on prototype devices now. And our hope is that in mid, 2021 or so, we would have a system that has 100-ish qubits and believe that we can scale to thousands over the next few years. Denny will talk more about that technology. would also emphasize we're not at the product stage yet, but we will soon be looking for uh, friendly users to be able to run on the first of these systems. And then on the uh, what we call QPS for quantum positioning system, playing off of uh, GPS, uh, we're working on both clock as well as positioning devices, mostly funded by uh, government R&D contracts to build products, to build prototypes leading. And then on RF sensing, we're doing work on sort of direction finding, and it's again a couple of years behind, but believe that we'll be able to create devices that are hundreds to maybe thousands of times more sensitive or more accurate than you can with today's uh, technologies. And underlying a lot of the sensor work is kind of a different approach to AI and machine learning. We won't talk about that today, but kind of stay tuned. That is a, a sort of an internal thing that we do to tune the sensors, and I think it will have external applications too over time. And so maybe I'll just say a couple of words about these other technologies. And then Denny will talk about computing. So, so GPS, as you know, we all use it. We love it. Those in Europe, of course, it's GNSS. Uh, and it's terrific uh, until it isn't. And the challenge with it is that the signals between the satellites and our, you know, our uh, handheld devices are very faint. And so they can suffer denial of service attacks and then without too much trouble. And then secondly, and maybe worse, the signals can be spoofed and people or device or you know platforms will think they're someplace where they aren't. And uh, so this on the right side is a comment by one of the many US Secretaries of Defense in the last few years, Ash Carter, who uh, basically said that he hates GPS because of the vulnerability. And I uh, can't wait until, he, this wasn't a Coquana ad, but he can't wait until this uh, Nobel Prize winning devices come along to be able to create more secure uh, GPS type of systems. And so we're, we're behind that, um, what are the components? Two major components, uh, clock, and then the, the devices that track changes in position, accelerometer and gyroscope. And we believe that over the next couple of three years, we can demonstrate that you can build quantum devices, clock and accelerometer gyroscopes. The gyroscope is a little harder, by the way, that initially would be in you know, packages that are maybe a couple of liters or something like that. So they probably go on larger vehicles or platforms at the start. 
but eventually they'll get miniaturized and you'll see them um, in many, many more places. So that's what we, we're working on. And um, why, would, why do we believe that? I won't go into any detail at all on these charts, but these are charts that show sort of the state of the art of accelerometers, gyroscopes, and clocks with most of the known products. And the vertical axis generally is a measurement of performance or accuracy of some kind. And the horizontal axis is a measure of the size, weight, and power swap. And so on these charts, down and to the left is goodness, meaning more performance or more accuracy. And then to the left on the horizontal, horizontal axis is less size, weight, and power, if you, which is very important if you're fielding a device that's going to be portable. Um, maybe less so in quantum computing. But uh, so what you would see here in each of these cases is where our prototype work is aiming. And this will be two or three years before we can demonstrate most of this. But this is, you can see, in most cases, we're, you know, 10 or 100 times, project to be 10 or 100 times more accurate or sensitive, say. And then starting within a, a, a size, weight, and power envelope that we know we can move to the left. So this is why this technology uh, is interesting, because for the same size, weight, and power, you can get... Uh, we believe much better accuracy or sensitivity or resolution, or if you're willing to give up some size, weight, and power, you can probably get even better performance. So again, starting to work on projects aimed at putting this together. And we have a big project in the UK called High Bias 2, funded by the UK government, where over the next couple of years, we expect to put prototype clock and gyroscope in a BAE aircraft and fly it to again demonstrate, much like we did with the space station, that the technology is rugged, works, is, uh, is deployable. So then maybe just a quick word on uh, using the same technology to detect uh, radio frequency signals. Uh, and the idea here is that we turn the atoms into um, more sensitive atoms by uh, uh, exciting the outer electron shell. Danny will talk a little bit about that. Um, and believe that they will be able to be 100 times plus or minus more sensitive than we have with some of today's RF technologies. And so we have some work going on to be able to demonstrate first that you could pick up a signal and you could figure out where it was coming from. And then if you can track it dynamically, I put quantum radar in quotes here. It's not really radar, but the idea is to track a signal. So, so uh, this is brand new technology, brand new ideas. There are just a couple of calls out from DARPA right now as we speak to be able to start exploring this technology. But it's going to be there. It's going to be part of your lifetime and part of this quantum revolution. So we just wanted to introduce it to you today. So the idea here is then, again, that we'll be able to go from the one technology to these other deployable systems, and that uh, it will be more than quantum computing. But most importantly, and first, is quantum computing, and I'll turn it over to Danny. I hope. Bo, can you hear me? Okay. Screen look okay there. Okay. Oops, that's not really what I wanted to see. There we go. Okay, here we go. So Bo painted the kind of technology landscape that cold quanta is involved in, and uh, I'm going to focus on the computing piece of it. Um, and I'm going to dive right down and introduce the cesium atom. Uh, this is the this is the uh, atom that we're using at the core of our quantum computer. And uh, like Bo mentioned, uh, cesium exists over there on the left edge of the periodic table. Um, and you can see this 6s electron that's hovering outside of the, uh, of the electronic configuration, the core of it here. Um, I've also circled xenon over here on the right edge of the periodic table, and that's because 
because um, one way you can think about the construction of the cesium atom is it's got a xenon core. Uh, the electrons behave as much as behave very much like they would in a xenon atom, and then we add this one 6s electron. Um, and by the way, at, at room temperature, cesium is actually, uh, or a little bit warmer than room temperature, cesium actually forms a liquid metal. It's one of the a few elements that does that. So um, this is, again, this uh, kind of inner core of the uh, cesium atom, the electronic configuration. You can see it's got all these uh, filled electronic shells here. And that means that that inner core is very stable and effectively the 6s electron that uh, floats out outside of this inner core is the thing that uh, determines most of the behavior of the cesium atom as far as we're concerned. Um, the 6s electron has a half unit of spin. The nucleus has a seven halves a unit of spin. And so when you couple those together, uh, you can either couple them uh, anti-parallel or parallel. And so the total spin state that you get out of the, uh, the configuration is, is either F equals three or F equals four. Uh, that's units of angular momentum in H bar. And the reason that this is interesting is because when the 6s electron makes a transition upward by absorbing uh, some light or it makes a transition downward by emitting light, um, these, these two hyperfine levels are very stable. They have very narrow line width. And so the frequency of the emitted or absorbed photon is extremely precise. Uh, 9.2 gigahertz is the frequency and it's got a 3.26 centimeter wavelength. The reason that's interesting is because um, we actually have pinned the definition of the second to those two states uh, of the cesium atom, or more precisely, the transition between those two states. Um, up until 1967, we actually pinned the definition of the second to the Earth's uh, revolution around the sun. And we had defined a second as being about 1 31 millionth of that time. But uh, by around 1967, we understood that, that some of these atomic transitions were so stable that we could actually do a better job um, defining the second in terms of uh, periods of the light emitted during these transitions. And so since 67, our second is defined as about 9.2 uh, billion cycles of the, uh, of the transition, uh, the radiation emitted when, when a, an electron in the cesium atom makes a transition between the F equals four and the F equals three state. And so those are referred to as the clock states of cesium because it's how we define a clock. Well, given the fact that we've got this incredible ability to uh, manipulate atoms now with, a with lasers, and we can actually uh, kick atoms from one state to another um, in a very precise way, um, natural question as well, could I make a quantum computer using this technology? And so these are the criteria that uh, DiVincenzo laid out for what a, a quantum computer is about 20 years ago. Um, fundamentally, you have to uh, be able to define a set of qubits, prepare them in a fiducial state, which is your initial state. You want a long decoherence time. You want a universal set of gate operations so that you can apply any unitary transformation that you want to this uh, register of qubits, and then you need to be able to make a measurement. So these are, these are effectively the challenges that you've got to meet in order to build a, a quantum computer. Um, and we know that there are many different uh, uh, technology approaches. Bo has, has talked about these a little bit. I've kind of laid them out here um, along with the companies that are pursuing these various approaches. Um, we're pretty familiar with superconducting qubits. Uh, these companies here are building uh, quantum computers. The only asterisk I would put here is D-Wave because the D-Wave system is not designed to meet DiVincenzo's criteria. But other than that, all of these companies are using superconducting qubit technology to make a quantum computer. Um, trapped ions, another popular approach uh, being pursued by Honeywell, IonQ, AQT over in Innsbruck, Germany. Microsoft is uh, pursuing the notion of a topological qubit. Uh, Xanadu and PsiQuantum are pursuing photonic qubits. And cold quanta is pursuing the notion of a cold uh, atom qubit here. And there are several other companies in this space as well. So um, what I'm going to do then over the next few slides is uh, dive into a little bit of detail 
I'll follow the lead of Mark Safman and I'll talk about how cold quant is actually using this technology to, uh, to make a quantum computer. Mark is a physics professor at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, and he's been working in this field for uh, a couple of decades, actually. He's also on the staff at Cold Quanta. Uh, you'll notice that this Revmont Phys uh, paper came out 10 years ago. And so um, Mark and others in the field have been kind of laying out the blueprint for how to build a quantum computer using this cold atom technology. So the architecture of the system looks kind of like this. Um, at the heart of it, we've got this qubit array. And uh, the word qubit here is sort of interchangeable with cesium atoms. So this is an array of cesium atoms that we're going to manipulate and treat them as individual qubits. And this is in this uh, UHV, that's ultra high vacuum cell. Bo showed you some pictures of that. So in order to populate this, we're going to need to uh, wrangle a bunch of atoms, cool them down, and then get them into this array. So I'll talk about a few of those steps in the next couple of slides. Um, once we have the uh, array uh, set up and initialized, we use a combination of lasers and microwaves to implement uh, single qubit gates and uh, two qubit gates that entangle the state of qubits. We also have global gates, which is a very interesting capability. I'll mention that uh, too. And when we, uh, when we use lasers and microwaves here on the qubit array, we have to um, modulate the lasers and frequency, spatial, uh, mo uh, spatial modulation, uh, polarization. And that's all accomplished with a set of modulators here that's driven by some real-time electronics and microcode. Um, so after we've applied a set of gates to our qubit array, uh, we have our final state. We want to see what the final state is. So we um, blast the qubit array with photons. Uh, we have this high numerical aperture optics, uh, collect the photons in a camera, and you get an image that looks something like this that we have to interpret to figure out what the computational basis state is of each of the qubits in the array. So this is the overall architecture. And uh, I'll just, uh, over the next couple of slides, talk in a little bit more detail about a few of these steps. So the first one I'll talk about is, is uh, laser cooling. Um, and uh, to many of you, laser cooling may be uh, kind of a standard, well understood thing. But for me, it was kind of novel to learn about it as I cold quanta. You normally think of lasers as depositing energy in a system and it would heat it up. But we actually can use lasers to cool atoms and there are three different uh, sort of principles that we rely on when we do that. The first is that uh, lasers, uh, it's a light field, light has a radiation pressure that can actually push on an object. So what you see here on the left side is, is a picture of comet Hale-Bopp and its tail points away from the sun and partially due to the radiation pressure of the photons pouring off of the sun. They push the tail away. So that's the first fact. Second fact is, is if you look at the way atoms interact with light, uh, atoms have very specific absorption lines or emission lines where they can absorb or uh, give off photons of a very specific frequency. Um, but if you hit an atom with light that is tuned in between these lines, then the atoms will effectively uh, ignore the light. So atoms are very selective in their interactions with the light, and we can use that. And then the third principle we need here is the Doppler effect. It just means that if a, a, a wave source is moving towards you, the uh, wave crests will pass you more quickly. So the frequency of the wave appears to be shifted higher. If the source of the wave is moving away from you, then um, the wave crests are hit you at, with a bigger time gap between them, time interval, and so the frequency appears to be shifted lower. Okay, so how do we use this? Well, imagine you have a cloud of atoms and the atoms each have kind of a thermal velocity distribution. So they're maybe moving a few hundred meters a second. And you shine a laser at the cloud of atoms and you detune the laser so it's just a little bit beneath one of these absorption lines here. Well, because most of the atoms uh, are just kind of buzzing around at, at room temperature, they are going to ignore this laser light. It's off resonance. But for the atoms that are moving uh, very 
very close to toward the laser beam, they're going to experience a Doppler shift. They're moving towards the source of that wave, and so the frequency of the laser will appear to be shifted higher. And if it's if the shift is enough, it'll bring it into resonance with one of these transitions that the atom can make. And in that case, the atom will actually start absorbing photons from the laser field, uh, and all those photons are coming from one direction. The atom will re uh, re emit those photons, uh, kind of in a uniform. Uh, set of directions, but the aggregate of that, of that uh, absorption and omission is the atom is going to be kicked backwards. So uh, by shining a laser, carefully tuned, you can actually slow these atoms down in one direction. So what you need to do to uh, cool atoms uh, and, and trap them is you have to combine a set of these lasers with a very clever configuration of magnetic fields. This is what Bo is referring to. Uh, Chu, Cohen, Tanuji, and Phillips won a Nobel Prize for this in 97. And what they recognized is that um, if you shine lasers from uh, six different directions into a central region and you detune these lasers and you carefully uh, polarize them, um, you also have to take advantage of what's called the Zeeman effect, which is the fact that uh, the different uh, energy levels of an atom respond to the presence of a magnetic field. But um, by taking advantage of these lasers and the magnetic field, which is generated by this pair of coils, you can actually trap a cloud of atoms here in the center of this thing. And so this is referred to as a magneto-optical trap, or a MOT for short. And amazingly enough, you can trap clouds of atoms like cesium in a MOT like this at around uh, several hundred microkelvin, so several hundred millionths of a degree away from absolute zero. So this is a, a step that we take on the way to populating that array of qubits. Um, it turns out that, uh, that Bo mentioned that cell that we uh, use to build that MOT is actually in a hard vacuum. We need that to be the case because once that um, MOT is populated with cesium atoms, if there are background gas atoms, they'll knock the cesium atoms back out of the MOT. So you can't actually load up the MOT. Um, so this actually is a little bit of a challenge because you need background atoms from some source to load the MOT, but you don't want them there because they'll knock uh, atoms back out of the MOT. This device that I'm showing you here is uh, a clever engineering solution to that, and it actually incorporates two stages of uh, magneto-optical traps. There's a, a primary one here on the bottom, and then uh, a secondary one here on the top. So what happens is this lower magneto-optical trap uh, traps cesium atoms from a kind of a relatively normal background vapor pressure. And then there's a vertically oriented laser beam that we use to kick atoms, uh, cesium atoms, out of the lower MOT in a vertical stream that moves upward. And then these are slow moving cesium atoms such that the top MOT can capture them. So this is actually how we solve the problem of uh, filling this MOT without having a lot of background atoms there. So that gets us a nice filled MOT. Um, and then what we're going to do next is turn on the grid of laser beams that Bo talked about. But the problem is when we turn on this grid of laser beams, we actually may end up trapping several cesium atoms per site. And we don't want that. We want one single cesium atom per site in the trap. So we need to have a mechanism that we use to make sure that, that if there are multiple cesium atoms in a trap site, we can kick out all but one. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you see that we start off with um, say in, in this case, it looks like five cesium atoms in the trap site. Um, R refers to what's called a Rydberg state. Uh, and that's, that's uh, when we take that 6s electron and we kick it up to a pretty high excited state. Um, so through a, com uh, through a combination of kicking one of these atoms up to an excited state and then effectively kind of blasting the remaining atoms out, we, we end up with one atom left behind in the trap site. Um, so there are a variety of mechanisms available to do this. This is one of them. We actually use a slightly different one, which is called light-assisted collisions, but it achieves the same end goal. So um, once you've gone through these steps, you end up with uh, a uh, two-dimensional array of these trap sites, and each trap site has a single cesium atom in it. The space in between the atoms is on the order of a few microns. 
And uh, this would not be possible with an ion-based system because of the Coulomb repulsion between ions. But since these uh, cold atoms are neutral, there's no Coulomb repulsion, and so we can pack them pretty tightly into this 2D array. Um, and once they're packed in here, we can use uh, control lasers uh, to zap individual cesium atoms uh, or pairs of cesium atoms. Uh, or in fact, we can use a combination of microwaves and lasers to hit the entire array. And through these mechanisms, we initialize the cesium atoms and we can uh, run single qubit gates or uh, entangling gates or actually global gates that spread across the entire uh, array at once. So I'll talk a little bit about our two qubit entangling gate. Um, this is a particular protocol that implements a CNOT gate for a pair of qubits. You can see the input and the output, oops, I'm sorry, you got that backwards. The input and the output states here of the pair of qubits. Um, we actually have the ability to implement these entangling gates. If uh, you imagine that this is the control qubit, the center here, then the four nearest neighbors can each be thought of as the target uh, qubit in a, in a CZ gate, for example. Um, that's how our initial system is going to work. But using the same technology, we can expand the footprint of the interactions so that this uh, central qubit could act as a, a control qubit for uh, perhaps uh, eight or 12 or even more other uh, target qubits around it. Uh, so this is a really nice benefit of this approach because if you have these longer range interactions, uh, it means that you can get away with fewer swaps in order to bring a state from one qubit to another qubit so that they can interact with each other. So uh, these are kind of the building blocks that we use um, to, to initialize the array, manipulate the qubit states in the array, and then measure at the end. Um, so kind of pulling away from the abstract description and looking at the actual physical device, this is a picture of the prototype system uh, in Mark Safman's lab at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, it's kind of hard to pick out all the elements here on the optics table, but there are lasers, there's optical fiber for routing the laser uh, signals around, there are modulators here, uh, optics, uh, detectors for actually detecting the computational basis states of the qubits, and then buried in the heart of this uh, setup here is that quantum core that Bo is referring to. And this is that 3D MOT um, that is an ultra high vacuum. And then this is exactly where we would put this grid of laser beams to trap the 2D grid uh, of cesium atoms. So this is kind of what the prototype system looks like that we're bringing up now in, in, uh, in Wisconsin. And at the same time, we're building a, a productionalized version of this in our corporate headquarters in Boulder. Um, so pulling back a little bit, I've, I've been describing a bit of the physics and uh, technology that supports the, uh, the system here, but this can't work without a, kind of a deep set of layers of software. Um, so uh, kind of generically, if you have a quantum computing problem that you've stated at some sort of a logical level up here, uh, to run it on a quantum computer, you need to pick some sort of a quantum algorithm like uh, QAOA or VQE or QBM. This is for optimization or chemistry problems or machine learning problems. Um, and then once you've formulated your problem um, in, a, in an algorithm like this, the uh, quantum circuits that come from this algorithm uh, are, are typically expressed in a logical way, meaning you're not really concerned about the connectivity of the qubits in your physical system, and you're not really concerned about the specific gates that are provided to you. You're just working at a logical level here. So you need to actually uh, convert this logical description into a description which is uh, effectively mated to the hardware. So that's called transpilation. Um, and once you have a physical quantum circuit, then you can convert it into pulses, which then kind of drive the control electronics. And uh, you can take your qubit arrays through a set of states, uh, measure the computational basis state of the array states, and then send that back to the user. So kind of moving all the way down through the stack and then back up is what you do for every shot of a quantum circuit. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the sort of system level picture that, that we have in the back of our minds. So 
our approach at Cole Quanta is to partner with uh, other providers of certain layers of the software stack. Um, we're bringing that hardware to the table, but uh, the technology to actually transpile quantum circuits, produce physical circuits from logical circuits, um, is actually, it's actually available in a number of different packages. You know, IBM's Qiskit package is, is one example. Um, there are other ones as well. Google has CERC, you know, from CQC, there's uh, PyTicket. Um, but for other kinds of applications, there are different options. Um, Mukai is a software package from QCI that's focused on um, optimization, uh, optimization uh, algorithms. So this is actually a simpler path uh, that you could use to get to our hardware that doesn't require you to actually build the quantum circuits like you would have to in Qiskit. Um, we're also thinking about um, working and collaborating with Oak Ridge uh, to see if their XACC compiler can be uh, targeted for our system. But the idea is all of these tools will allow you to go after the kind of a standard set of applications that people talk about for QC, you know, their optimization uh, applications, quantum chemistry applications, quantum machine learning. And uh, there are lots of examples in each one of these categories. But the idea is you should be able to take these, map them through one of these uh, standard interfaces. It would interface with our backend software, kind of our microcode, if you will, uh, convert the problem into something that fits into our cell here, and then return results back to users. Um, one little reminder I have uh, is uh, our system actually does not have any cryogenics in it. It's kind of remarkable um, that you can achieve these temperatures without the use of liquid nitrogen or pulse tube dilution refrigerators, but uh, the laser cooling techniques actually allows our system to get to kind of a nominal operating temperature of around 10 micro Kelvin. It's roughly a factor of a thousand colder than you can get to with a pulse tube dilution refrigerator. And we can achieve and maintain that temperature through a combination of laser cooling and the ultra high vacuum and the uh, kind of environmental separation that this cell provides between the uh, cubit array inside and the, the background environment. So um, I just had uh, one more slide here. Uh, I just wanted to put a simple example up of, this is uh, some code on the right side of the slide using Qiskit, um, and it's a simple a tomography example. The idea is that I'm going to um, use, uh, I, I imagine that I have 30 qubits in my array, and I'm going to initialize each of those qubits individually to a state on the block sphere. And then I'm going to measure uh, each of those qubit wave functions along the z-axis, the x-axis, and the y-axis some number of times. And if I measure it, uh, measure each of those wave functions, if I recreate the wave function enough times and measure it over and over again, I can very precisely figure out where each of those wave functions uh, actually started off being. And you can see that with 10 shots per coordinate, I don't really do a very good job resolving them. If I go up to 100 shots, you can see the cluster is starting to tighten up. At 1,000 shots per coordinate, you can see that this actually looks like some letters. And when I get to 10,000 shots per coordinate, you can see that these are actually just, you know, spelling out a couple of letters on the block sphere. So this is done with standard Qiskit, and uh, and this is actually a simulation. It's not run on our hardware yet, but uh, we'll be running this on the hardware in the very near future. So um, I'm guessing that maybe many of you on the call have seen this comic, but I love it. It's kind of uh, it says a lot about quantum computing. Um, and I will close with a list of references here. So these are papers that Mark Safman has uh, written over the last uh, 10 or so years. And uh, these go into various levels of detail about, about the technology. Um, some of these are kind of review articles. This one here, 2018 um, in National Science Review and the one in 2017 from Physics Today. These are great starting points. Um, the other ones go into a lot more detail about the specific, specifics of the interactions and whatnot. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Diane, uh, who will uh, help us out with um, answering questions. So thank you very much. Thanks, Denny. Thanks, Bo. So we have a few questions that have come in. Um, well, I'll, just because it's easier for me to read down from the top in the Q&A window, um, 
So geopolitical tensions seem um, a rising backdrop across the quantum technology sector. How will this affect the landscape for companies and investors seeking to create value in the sector? Sounds like a good question for Denny. <laughs> <laughs> but um, may, maybe I'll take a crack at it. So, you know, the kind of the reality of the world, in fact, is that there are competing nation states um, and the this technology is a certainly a dual use technology. It will have great uh, application in civilian applications, but also military applications. Having said that, I think there's sort of a layered approach here that's going on. And one is we're we're so new to this technology. It is sort of as when the transistors were invented in the late 1940s and ICs came about. And then it took many, many years of uh, more work and then the application of them. And, the, and similarly for lasers. So the, my, this is just a guess, but my guess is that we're some parts of this technology are still kind of in the science and R&D phase. I think there will be, you know, many of our colleagues the, you know, the question may have been pointed at China sort of versus the U.S. Uh, many of our colleagues in China, in fact, uh, our, you know, friends went to school here in the U.S. Uh, they, they work on things in China. We work on things in the U.S. The U.K. is actually, I think, the leader in having a national uh, quantum initiative. And so we, we have a subsidiary in the U.K. And, and lots of great work going on there. So I guess a, a very long answer to say, I think the science part will continue and there will be a lot of collaboration amongst scientists and in the early, early uh, days of R&D. I think civilian applications of things quantum will be global. Uh, I do think the military applications of things quantum will tend to be uh, you know, compartmentalized or uh, uh, be available in certain geographies. So I think it'll kind of go the way that we saw, um, you know, the, the digital technologies and to some extent the communication technologies go. Okay, thank you. Um, how do the cold atom qubits differ from RF and U-wave qubits technology? And what are the differences in stability and compactness? That sounds like Denny. <laughs> well, um, I'm not an atomic, molecular, and optical physicist, so I'm not going to be able to dive into, uh, you know, differentiations between, you know, why are we using cesium versus rubidium or, or, or whatnot. But the, the essence of systems like this is that we need to control the state of uh, these qubits, in our case, cesium atoms. And so, the, the stability and precision of a system like this boils down to how good a job you're able to do uh, creating and stabilizing lasers, modulating them, controlling their, uh, you know, their polarization or frequency or spatial characteristics. And every choice that you make, um, if, you're, if you're comparing different atomic species, different atomic species have different, uh, you know, wavelengths associated with a transition from one state to another. So you end up having to acquire lasers and modulating devices uh, in the market that, that are produced for, for uh, typically other applications and then we repurpose them for use in quantum computing. So right now we're not at a volume level where we're making millions of these things a year and, and we can we have a tremendous amount of demand in the market. So in some sense we're kind of uh, using the best technology that we can find in the market. Um, so the, the decision to, to make a cesium uh, atom the heart of our system is kind of, it flows from the availability of razor, lasers and modulators that we can use to, to trap the atoms, uh, you know, manipulate them and interrogate them. I, I hope that's an answer for your question. Thanks, Denny. Might cold quanta technology be applied to 5G technology solutions? If so, what might some applications in 5G be? In RF towers, perhaps? Denny, do you want to try? I'll, uh, I can give sort of the 30,000 foot answer. I think that the answer, the only answer I know is maybe. So what we expect are that these, this 
technology um, in, uh, as applied to RF signaling will be that we'll be able to uh, detect signals that are, you know, say a hundred times more faint than you can detect with digital technologies. So there might, and across some broad spectrum is what we expect. So there may be some application really too early, I think, for us to know as a company and certainly for me to know. So that's sort of a, I don't know, answer. No, I, I think I think what you're saying is right. The the ability to make incredibly accurate sensors with this technology is there, uh, and also over an incredibly wide uh, bandwidth range. So, if you're building, uh, I don't know if it's going to be 5G or 6G or 7G out there somewhere, but um, if you're trying to pick up faint signals uh, and they're you know with a frequency characteristic that would challenge normal receivers, then I think that this technology might be quite useful. Great, thank you both. Next question. For quantum computing applications, how large an array do you envisage having a, in a single cell before you have to look at modular cell-to-cell -cell links? Um, I don't really, uh, we, we have a scaling path and uh, I, our intention is to come out with an array of perhaps up to uh, 64 qubits uh, early next year in a prototype system. And then I think we're going to be driving to 100 qubits by the end of 2021 and hundreds of qubits in the year following. And I think within about three-ish years, we're, we're talking about about 1,000 qubits. Um, so right now we're focused more on scaling up. I know that uh, with other architectures, um, trapped ion, it's a little bit harder to see how to scale to that same uh, level so that there's a lot of talk about, you know, interconnect between modules. Um, I don't think we're really pursuing that right now because we, we believe that we're going to be able to scale up to a pretty significant number before we need to start thinking about that problem. But it is probably something in our future but not this year. Yeah, I would just uh, tag on to that in that the technology is very scalable along two of the two of the arguably most important dimensions of quantum computing. One of those is the number of qubits, and then the second is the interconnectivity, the connectivity between the qubits. And he showed you an example of that. Um, on the scalability of the qubits, this uh, we have uh, one a DARPA program called ONISC for optimization on noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And as part of that, and I should note it's an R&D program, so this is not a promise of a product at this point. Uh, but for that program, we hope to have thousands of qubits in operation over the next, a thousand at least, or likely thousands of qubits in operation over the next three or four years. So we do believe in the technology. We've demonstrated to ourselves how well it scales. We've demonstrated how we can connect qubits. We have some work to do on the quality of the qubits and sort of on the cycle time of the machine, if you will. But I think this technology is going to be, at least of those that we know about, going to be the winner on scalability for the next few years, if not the longer term, and also on connectivity between qubits. So you can see it uh, going from where we are today to you know thousands of qubits. Beyond that, a lot of engineering and, and uh, R&D work needs to take place, but clearly uh, into the thousands. Great, I'm gonna... Um ask one more question and the rest of them we will respond to um, via email so um, because we actually are right up on 12 o'clock but i think um, we were kind of reaching to this anyway denny so how far beyond neighboring qubits can you couple the mechanism that we use is a thing called the Rydberg blockade, and this actually allows us to reach pretty far. Um, one of the one of Mark Safman's papers that I referred to talks about this in detail, but we believe we'll be able to reach out to next next nearest neighbors. Uh, you know, certainly on the order of uh, the control qubit can probably interact with probably as many as 20 or more target qubits in our CZ entangling gate. That won't be true in our first generation system, but we believe that's realistic uh, in successive generations. 
Great. And thank you both. And thank you everyone for joining us. And as I said, we will respond to the questions we weren't able to get to live um, here. So thank you all for joining and watch for next month's webinar. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> so long. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> thank you.